Good Wednesday, everyone. Welcome to the Blue Water Climate Control VolQuest.com podcast as we continue to look back on the 2019 season and kind of what we learned from that season, how it will translate into this football team in 2020. Today, we look at uh, just an ugly afternoon of football for Tennessee as uh, they go to the swamp and they get manhandled by the Florida Gators in this game, uh, 34 to 3. Guys, when you look back and rewatch this game, there, there, there were some moments where Tennessee did some good things, but there wasn't a game that they they shot themselves in the foot more than they did this game all season long. No, there wasn't. And, you know, to be honest with you, Brent, I mean, I thought this was the real beginning of the yo-yo at quarterback. You know, I remember sitting in the press box shortly after halftime, and when, you know, when they made the move to Brian Maurer, Jesse looked at me and goes, there's no way they go back to, to, to J.G. And I agreed with him. And then yet – a couple of series later, here he comes right back in the game. I mean, it, it was one of those moments where Tennessee could do nothing right on either side of the ball. And, um, you know, it was just – it was an ugly performance from the word go. And, uh, you know, I mean, it'll be – to me, it could be just as tough this year when you play Florida because Trask is back in a year better. And, uh, you know, they do lose some key pieces on that defensive line, but Florida's got some nice pieces coming back as well. You know, for me, when I look at it, I mean, we're going to talk about the offense because the offense was really bad and struggled in a lot of areas. But the great divide that was the middle of the football field for Tennessee's defense in this game uh, was pretty remarkable. Uh, How did Tennessee, A, fix that later on, Jesse, and B, why was it so wide open in the middle of the field all day long? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've had the stats right here. I mean, Tennessee's inside linebackers combined to give up seven uh, receptions on seven targets for over 100 yards. I mean, they got picked on. And honestly, Toa Toa uh, was not great in, in pass defense all season. That was probably the biggest area he struggled. Tennessee, I thought, uh, as they moved forward, kind of countered with that by honestly, he, he became kind of the extra rusher. They sent him a lot, you know as kind of a blitzer or an extra pressure guy. But this is something, you know, this is Dan Mullen's schemes. Mullen's scheme is to spread it out and use the middle of the field with some of the RPOs and quick stuff. Um, so how Tennessee, how Pruitt, Ansley adjust, you know, this next season, I think it's going to be something to watch. Defensively, ironically, Tennessee actually did a pretty good job stopping the run until they just kind of folded at the end. You know, I mean, it, Florida averaged 2.9 yards per carry through three quarters in this game. And then once the defense was like, all right, or defensive line, I should say, was like, all right, we're not getting any help from anybody else. That's when, you know, Florida ripped off runs of 11, 13, 11, like some of those yardage. But uh, Tennessee's got to be better defending the middle of the field. Obviously, they did improve that the rest of the season. Uh, I'll be curious about how kind of the safety play and inside linebacker play again happens this fall because that's, you know, how those two units coalesce is going to be very important for Jeremy Pruitt's defense. You know, Rob, as ugly as this game was, and it was ugly, there's no doubt about that. I mean, Tennessee had some opportunities early. Um, you know, the failure in the red zone again when Jawan Jennings drops a pass and then Jared missing Dominic Wood Anderson on the wide open uh, Florida bus the way he did, um, you know, really cost Tennessee any opportunity to be in that game because, I mean, th- there was a chance that game could have been 10 nothing at the half, but instead oh. it's 17, or it could have been 10 10 at the half at worst. Even though it's not been that long ago, I mean, the final score, the impression it, it left you with, you know, I, I guess kind of skewed it for me. I, I've really had forgotten. How, I mean, I don't, I don't think Tennessee wins that game under any circumstances, but you're, I mean, they were in that thing in, in the first half. It's 10 to nothing. They've been inside Florida's 10 yard line, get no points because of the, the interception you mentioned. They do a great job. Um, at one point, holding Florida to a field goal when the Gators got inside the ten, if and and the, I, th- I wrote it down. I, I, let, me, let me consult all my, my notes of futility here. Two hundred fifty yards of offense to eighty eight at the half, and yet you know Tennessee it, it literally had, had a chance to be right in it. The defense played a lot better than I remembered. Like Jesse just said, they, they did a really good job as far as ground game until the end, until that that final drive when Emory Jones came in and. And then the Gator just kind of marched down the field. But if well, Tennessee I, does anything early, the, the, as you, the dominant, you know, Guarantano missing DWA on that one pass, the interception on the goal line, I mean, uh, uh, just two huge plays that, that totally could change. I mean, I, again, I don't think Tennessee wins. But do something with, with those two plays, and it's a different story. 
Well, that series is a microcosm of JG's career. Yes, the one that 100%. he missed DWA because he misses DWA. He could have he could have thrown an arm punt and it would have been then a fifty I, I yard was... play. Then he throws a seed <laughs> when he's getting destroyed and he's getting his head on, knocked off on third and fifteen. Plays, yeah, and then on two plays later, he's and, and two plays later he has a miscommunication and throws just a terrible interception. I do think coming out of this game. Part of the reason Pruitt went kind of scorched earth on his team, and then it becomes lore afterwards that they get have a second team meeting. You know, once they get back to Knoxville, um, is for this very reason. What what Brent and Rob just brought up is that the the scoreboard did not indicate exactly how this game played out. Florida did not play that well. I mean, Trask threw a couple. This was a, his first, you know, real start uh, after Frank's got hurt. He throws a couple interceptions uh, in the red zone. They committed a bunch of penalties. Tennessee committed a bunch of penalties. But Pruitt was clearly so miffed, and they were just kind of grasping for straws because they were struggling so much offensively uh, that he goes bananas post game, not on us, but on his football team. And I think that that realization on the plane of, hey, I got to do something to reel these guys back in because if this is the nadir, Tennessee football has shown us in the last, in the private previous years before that you actually can get worse, and so for the fact that he had that recon recognition uh, to call that second team meeting coming out of this, and then I mean as we said, there's no way when AP and I were going home after this game, I, I would have thought that they were going to you know get bowl eligible, much less reel off six straight wins, even with the back half of the schedule being uh, what it was. You know, Austin, it's interesting that the move that, that Jeremy Pruitt did make to have the second meeting when he got back to Knoxville. Now, we didn't learn about that until later on in the year in November. And as Jesse said, it became about lore. But th there is some, th this was a moment of continued growth for Jeremy Pruitt as a head coach because he could have very easily lost his football team for the year right here. A and he makes the move to have the second meeting and it really saved the season. Say it saved this team in a lot of ways, don't you think? Well, after this game, though, you remember this was the fourth game. <clears throat> so after this game, you saw you know Will Ignat didn't even make that trip to Florida. You had several guys depart the team, and again, I'm not going to say those guys were cancers because I don't think that's fair. But I do think that they weren't all bought in, and when those guys departed, I think it helped the morale of this football team because you don't have, you, you don't have to, you're not necessarily a cancer. If you're just a Debbie downer, you just, yeah, this blows. I don't want to do this. And then it starts, you know, it, it, the guy beside of you picks up on that. And all of a sudden he starts when things have a bad day. I mean, I, I think that, you know, it had addition by subtraction coming out of this game. So yes, I think it's twofold. The, the meeting you guys just talked about coupled with the loss of, a couple of different guys that I don't think were helping this football team, I think helped this football team turn the corner in, in the coming weeks. Of course, they would go on next week to lose to Georgia, but they showed a little life, a little spark after that. Then they then they started the you know the seven of eight. Well, the bye week I think was pretty important coming out of this. Sure. I mean, you know, we discussed it in the moment whether it'd be better for them to just rip the band aid and play the next week or whatever, but. Obviously, hindsight being 2020, I think the bye week was very beneficial for this football team. We discussed it at the time. F folks were already calling for a youth movement. The youth movement was on. There was no Jeremy Pruitt's guys versus Butch Jones's guys. They were already playing the best guys. Um, but I think it allowed the staff to kind of had some have some you know intra introspection to kind of say, hey, how do how do we want to use some guys better? Again, this was a game they really struggled to get Callaway the ball at all. Uh, you know, that's very noticeable. I did not think this was a game that Jim Chaney, you know, if we, especially spinning forward, he cannot have a similar type game of this, I think, in 2020 when they play some of these better teams, whether it's Oklahoma, Florida, Georgia, Alabama. He got super pass happy in this game. You know, they run, they don't, they had almost no runs in the first half. Eric Gray rips off a couple to start the third quarter, and then Brian Mallard passes at 11 straight times. I mean, that's just, again, in the game. That was an issue, but moving forward, that's something that Cheney has done, you know, at, at his various stops, and that is not going to be the strength of this football team, I don't think, this fall, and so that's something he can't get caught up in. Well, I agree, because you don't have the weapons. I mean, they found Jennings early in this game for some success, and it was a little bit of fool's gold, because Florida 
negated that and, and shut that down. I think the other thing, too, in this game and going back and rewatching it was how much, Rob, that, that Jim Cheney was grasping at straws. Uh, I mean, you know, there, there's one series in the second quarter. They throw it basically laterally three straight times and punt. And, and he's afraid to throw it down the field, or maybe the quarterback's afraid to throw it down the field. We all know against Florida, the Florida's defense traditionally always runs sideline to sideline well. It, it was like Jim was looking at that Waffle House play sheet that he's got, and, and it was, okay, we haven't tried this one. Let's try this. I mean, there was no rhythm because it, it was almost like Jim got out of rhythm really bad after the DWA miss. You know, when, when Jared missed that call, which was wide open, coupled with the interception we talked about earlier in the end zone to Jawan Jennings, it, it's like Jim got out of a rhythm. He was just throwing stuff at the wall, see if something sticks. And it did. Yeah, and, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I agree with Jesse's point. The, I mean, the, the most head scratching element of the game was those 11 straight passes and the start of the second half. I, just, I think he just had no faith in the run game and, you know, I don't. I don't really blame him. I mean, the the longest run of the game was there early in the in the first half. Eric Gray got or second half. Eric Gray got loose for sixteen yards. But then even try. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I just. I mean, I I think he after that first half he just had no confidence. But you know that doesn't excuse you know, dropping dropping your true freshman quarterback in his first road road game back eleven straight times. And ah, uh, I mean, it was just. I mean, it just scalds your eyeballs to go back and, and look at how ineffective they were in, in, in that second half, especially. It just snowballed. It, well, I mean, as, ba- as bad as they were all year long, I think. Well, and again, I think, too, we saw this earlier in the year, particularly the Georgia State game. You know, it took, them, it took Jim Chaney and the offensive staff, in my opinion, Austin, multiple games, weeks, over a month to realize kind of what are our best weapons? They, had, they were forcing Dominic Wood Anderson in the passing game so intently, you know, that Josh Palmer wasn't a big deal. Now, we saw Palmer come about later in the year when he almost got away from DWA in the passing game a little bit. He, he, was, he had become option number three or four, whereas going into this game, you almost felt like it was Juwan Jennings and Dominic Wood Anderson were, were options one and two. That's where Jim had decided they were going to go. And and it just wasn't effective. And I think once they got away from trying to force some of that stuff to DWA, it opened up a little bit more of a vertical passing game for Tennessee later on in the year. Yeah, I mean, that's how it's not being 2020. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's exactly what happened. I mean, they kind of fell in love with the notion that DWA was going to be this, you know, all-world tight end. And, you know, when things didn't materialize, they just kept trying to fit, you know, square peg into round hole. So, um you know, you know, Josh Palmer, you know, we, I remember you and I being over there at, at camp last summer and, you know, I made the comment to Jim about, you know, Josh Palmer. And, and you could tell then that, you know, he liked Josh Palmer, but he did not feel like he was the alpha of the receivers or had the potential to be the alpha. Just thought he was a nice piece. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, when you look forward, you know, you got to hope that Josh, you know, becomes that alpha this year now that Jawan's out of the out of the receiver room. And, uh, you know, we'll be the marquee guy, but, you know, you're right. Trying to find the right playmakers, you know, understanding, you, you know, you can't get too pass happy, but then I just think the heat, there was, it was like, well, I'm not really sure what I have. So I'm just going to throw all the pieces to the puzzle out here on the table and just start trying to place them and see what fits. That's almost like what it was because we're playing multiple quarterbacks. We're playing multiple run. I mean, you know, we're, we're revolving door running back at times. You know, the receivers, you know, who, who's the key playmakers? I mean, I think that, that, you know, again, it's easy to look back and say that's exactly what happened because it was, you know, but at the time, I don't think any of us thought they're forcing, forcing, forcing the ball to DWA. Yeah, this came also because of injury, Jesse, started to force a little bit of their hand in terms of what they would become on the offensive line. I mean, I, I think this game, in part because of the injuries, help them determine moving into the next week, hey, who our top five, top seven guys are, and the rotation of things sort of stopped. You know, this idea of playing 10 linemen on the offensive side of the ball went away because they got a full look at some guys for an entire game due to some injuries that they had to play with. Yeah, because Jameer's not in this game, so Wanye gets the lion's share at at left tackle. Darnell and Calvert kind of split the reps at right tackle, but uh, Darnell also gets a lot of run at right guard in this game. Uh, you're right. I think it does. It did shake out, and now I think you know it's it's 
likely to be Wanye's spot at left tackle again with Trey and Brandon Kennedy, and I think it's going to be how that right side plays out that's going to be the most interesting whenever fall camp resumes because Darnell is going to, th- I think, in my opinion, going to have to legitimately beat out Calvert to get that spot. Cade is the wild card. You know, if he gets his uh, waiver, which is expected, you know, one would presume him to be kind of the front runner at right guard, but Jerome Carvin's not just going to lay down there. So there should be some good competition. I will say on the defensive line, this was the game. They did not, they could not generate any pass rush unless they blitz, unless they were sending, you know, a, a corner blitz or toe to toe or Batuli off the edge. They weren't getting any pass rush. But def- the defensive line, um, this is the game that Matthew Butler kind of inserted himself officially into the rotation. Same for Karat Garland. Uh, and you saw that, okay, it's not just a blip after the first couple games. Greg Emerson can at least give Tennessee 10 snaps a game. Sometimes it was more than that, but, you know, that, that he could become a, a, a serviceable uh, lineman, which ultimately turned into a rotation up front of, you know, a, a solid group. They weren't, they weren't dynamic, but they became a solid group. This was the first game against, a, you know, a pretty good offense uh, that they kind of were able to show that, I thought. Yeah, Jesse, I was going to say on, on rewatch, that's what jumped out probably the most to me as far as where they got better at as year wore on was the pass rush. I mean, they, could, they, they didn't bother Trask at all unless they blitzed, and then he picked them apart down the field. I think and you saw that Batuli had two sacks, no, no sacks from defensive linemen. And to go from that to being a unit that you know pushed 30 sacks on the season – I thought that was – you could really see some dramatic improvement if you look at where they ended up in November to what they looked like against Florida that day in terms of pass rush. Now, as we talked about, they did a pretty good job just to run all day long. But I, I thought that unit – just you could really just kind of use that as a measuring stick for where they improved. I, I think that's coupled with development and the fact that just a lot of these guys haven't played a ton of football. I mean, you know, they, they're they just starting to – at this point in the season, they're just kind of – grasping the surface of actual reps of, of, of game reps i mean you know when you really look at you know the guys you're talking about i mean matthew butler hadn't played a ton of football in his first few years here um Karak garland was the guy that again tennessee took at the 14th hour you know when his teammate you know jordan young went to florida state um you know obviously darrell middleton you know <laughs> he's, he's never really been bought into the defensive line until he actually he, got benched he, in this game but yeah, yeah, but I'm, I'm just saying, point. like, but, but we yeah, just start just rolling down the list of guys that are on the defensive right. line. The, the number of guys that have played actual real quality snaps is few and far between, you know. And so, especially with Emma Gooden out, you know. So, I mean, I, yeah, and, and I mean, like Florida, they did a decent job of, of, of defending the run. But I also say, Florida wasn't a great running team at this point in the season either. I mean, you go back to the first few games, they struggled to run it. Even they, they struggled to run it at Kentucky until they hit that you know, end around that, you know, late in the game. So, I mean, like, it's not like they were just some juggernaut on the ground. So I don't want to give Tennessee's defensive line too much credit for that. Um, but, you know, I think this was the part where they really started to, you know, take a step in the right direction going down the line and d- develop the depth that we saw down the line. Which should ultimately end up being a strength for this team this year because yeah. of, uh, you know, the baptism by fire, some of those guy, guys got in the – and the reps that they accumulated throughout throughout the year. The, the other thing on defense that stood out to me is kind of the enigma that's Theo Jackson. You know, you talk about JG, the epitome of JG on on one particular drive where he misses wide open and then he gets drilled in the face and and you know throws a ball that's that's a great throw. You, you see some flashes where Theo you say, boy, Theo Jackson could cover a lot of ground. He should be able to really help Tennessee in the secondary at the safety spot. Then he has other moments where he disappears. And when you talk about replacing Nigel Warrior, what are you going to do back there? You know, uh, th- these are types of guys that you kind of wonder, like, can the light bulb come on? I mean, Flowers has got hurt, and he had struggled prior to. Jackson will make a play, and then he busts a player, disappears a play. I mean, who's going to be the guy, Jesse, that can be uh, some kind of consistency back there, I guess, beside McCullough to, to be their answer at safety? Who can cover really sideline to sideline like a Jackson can athletically? Yeah, and who do they? I mean, and this is a, you know who do they who who is the staff ultimately going to trust? We don't know. You know, right. this is again. I mean, if you what if you're talking about this game in this moment, the week prior to this game, Jeremy Banks has two interceptions. Yes, one of them was thrown right to him, 
but he has two interceptions at inside linebacker. Tennessee's getting picked apart by Trask uh, on those, you know, middle of the field throws. Banks doesn't play a single snap on defense. Not one. Yeah. I mean, it's just not, he's not a factor. So again, who do they trust? Now, the this is right. This you know? is right when some of that off the field stuff was happening, but he still played special teams. So it's like if you're going to play him at all, you know. So, it, but to your point, it it, it's, it goes hand in hand with with what what's going to happen at safety. Who who is this staff ultimately trust? Yeah, yeah I, think, and, and, oh, I was going to say. Go. Speaking of safety, just I, I talked about the pass rush getting better. I mean, how much better did Nigel Warrior get? And after he was this terrible game? in this game. Oh, I, I mean, to go from the, the, what what he played like in Gainesville to be the first team. All SEC safety. I mean, you're, you're talking about some major, major steps. The one that I guess probably the biggest pass play for hit of the day uh, there early in the, in the first half. You know, Nigel just got completely turned around. That and, should have been and, a touchdown, but yes, it was a bad throw I mean, by Trask to, yeah. to go for you know from that performance to, to what we saw him you know it, late, later in the season is pretty remarkable. Well, which is why every NFL executive executive out there is trying to figure out what he is. You know, because if you watch the first four games of the year, last year of his senior year, he, he's not even a free agent type guy. Then he becomes an all-conference safety. So you're trying, you're trying to figure him out, which is why he's such an enigma when it comes to the draft and the fact he didn't have a pro day, he didn't get invited to the combine and, and how that works, you, you know, has worked against him will, will make it interesting to see. As we close it out here, um, when you when you think when you watch this game again and then you look at where this team ended up, what's your biggest takeaway from this game? Is it just the meeting? Is it just I mean, is there really that much to hey, they met when they got back in Knoxville? Is it the open date? You know, is it the they had to hit this point to kind of you know to get everybody to buy in? I mean, w- when you look at big picture after rewatching this game, what's your biggest takeaway from this game? I would say, aside from the 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 team meeting, and again, kind of the that that I do I do think gets glamorized or, or glorified a little bit more than probably it should. But ultimately, when they started fixing their mistakes, they started playing comp- pretty much after the Georgia game. Florida st- or T- Tennessee started playing better complementary football. In this game, they forced the defenses the defenses force three turnovers, but the offense gives it away three times, and they only score three points off said turnovers. Uh, so when you start playing comp- complementary football, you see what the results of what happens against teams that you're kind of in a in a uh, in terms of a vacuum closer talent wise with. So the Missouris, the Kentuckys, some of these games you pull off the wins. I think that's kind of my biggest takeaway is they they were able to figure out how to kind of mesh both sides of the balls together. Rob, I mean, my biggest takeaway is just how much more cohesive and uh, they they were at at the end of the year in November. I mean, you go you look at the, the, the Tennessee team that went on the road at Kentucky, that went on the road at Missouri. And it, it just bears no resemblance to the team that, that you saw in, in Gainesville that day. I mean, they they just learned how to win. They learned how to you know do little things and, and quit. Quit just shooting themselves in the foot, and yeah, I mean those teams aren't as good as Florida. I, I don't, I'm not trying to say that, but I mean Tennessee was just non-competitive. I mean they didn't belong in the same field as Florida. Thirty four to three, it could have been. I mean it could have easily been forty nine to three, very easily. And just the the buy in is is what as as the season goes on. I mean at that day, I'm not saying Tennessee quit or laid down, but I mean as Austin alluded to earlier, you had some guys who. You know, weeded themselves out of the system, and I, and I just think that that by the end of the year, Tennessee looked like looked like a football team that believed in itself, that was, everybody was rowing in the in the same direction, and they did not look that way in, in Gainesville against Florida, despite you know the bad quarterback play, penalties, whatever. They just did not look like a cohesive football team, and in November they did. Austin, well, I, I think it's <clears throat> I don't, again. I'll, I'll talk about what you know what. I think now, months later, um, I, I think we learned that over time that this was a tough-minded football team. That, you know, when you look at some of the – and, I, you know, I love to reference the scar. The, the Mark West Calloways, Nigel Warriors, Daryl Taylors, Daniel Batulis, uh, you know, they, they had a lot of scars. And, and, you know, for them to be that tough-minded to pick themselves up off the mat when they could have just laid there. They could have exited Mac Gainesville and just decided to lay there. I think we learned that this team had a bunch of 
bunch of guys that were really tough minded that, as Rob said, started to play, you know, really well together. But I think they just showed their toughness coming out of this game because, again, they had every reason to mail it in and they didn't. Yeah, I, I, and, and you I know, think, AP, I, it proved to me that I mean, Jeremy Pruitt could could reach his his kids. I mean, I, I wasn't sure, and I don't know if anybody was if, if that was the case. But I mean, it, to be able to to make the turnaround they did, I mean, tells you that that he can connect with with his players. Yeah, I think that was certainly the case. You know, and again, I think your leadership on your football team deserves a ton of credit, and Jeremy Pruitt and his staff figured out the way. Uh, a way to push some right buttons. It wasn't perfect the next week, but it got better, uh, obviously, moving forward, which we'll dive into in the coming weeks as well. Uh, But that's going to do it for this Florida rewind or Florida look back of uh, that game and how it affects that season and this upcoming season as well. And I want to tell you about our good friends at Blue Water Climate Control. Allergy season is here. Uh, Allergy sufferers are looking for a safe airspace. You know that pollutants in your home are two to ten times worse than outdoors. Blue Water Climate Control offers solutions to protect your airspace in various ways. To find out more about how you can get help in your home with your allergies, contact Blue Water Climate Control today for a free consultation at 865-299-2290. Don't forget to mention VolQuest. But for all you allergy sufferers out there, this is a great time for you to call and learn more about how your HVAC system can help you in your home with your allergies. For Rob Lewis, Jesse Simonton, and Austin Price, I'm Brent Hubs. Thanks for joining us on this Season Rewind podcast. We'll talk to you with the Mailbag podcast on Friday.